Hello, I greet you. And I greet you in the presence of the Most Holy Trinity. In the strong presence, in the powerful presence of the Most Holy Trinity, of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. How lovely it is to speak of God and to think of God and to speak to God, the Most Holy Trinity. As you know, I always start my talk with some suggestions or even one suggestion about how to grow in our perfect love for God or how to get this perfect love of God if we don't have it. Those who have a perfect love of God in them will only desire to do God's will for them. Each one of us has a plan by God. So, it's our duty to follow this plan and to follow it out of our love for God. So, those who have a perfect love of God do only what God wants them to do. And they do it for the love and glory of God. This is something which all of us can uh, make what we call, we can call examination of conscience. We do many things during the day. Do you think that everything we are doing or you are doing, let's say you are doing, everything you are doing is drawing you closer to God? Uh, try not to bring excuses. There can be many excuses to do this and to do that. Indeed, in, in reality, in reality, what you are doing during the day, one thing after another, do you think that everything you are doing is part of God's plan upon you, for you? <clears throat> this is something which we can test it through an examination of conscience, especially those who are either who want to start having a perfect love of God, or if they have already started, they are still, still in their beginnings. They need to do examinations of conscience, sincerely, in the presence of the Most Holy Trinity. If you are in church, in the presence of Jesus, really present there, indeed, with body and blood, soul and divinity, Jesus, the same one, the same Jesus who, were, who was alive here on earth 2,000 years ago. We, we need to do an examination of conscience. Now, consequently, consequently that is of those who have a perfect love of God want to do what God wants them to do, God's plan for them, and they do it for his love and glory. Consequently, those who have a perfect love of God will always be happy with God. This is the characteristics, one of the characteristics of those who have perfect love of God. Happiness, gladness. You are always happy with God, notwithstanding anything, whatever happens, and even among all disappointments, you remain calm and happy with God. Don't get discouraged if you are not like that. And don't think about your character, perhaps your character is a bit, you know, uh, not a calm, you don't have a calm character, but nothing at all. This is not something natural. This is something on, the, I shall come to it now, about the will, what we want, not what we, what we feel, say. 
Consequently, those who have a perfect love of God will be always happy with God. They never seek to be praised or honored by those around them. That is important, very important. We seek only the glory of God. We praise God. Whatever good we have comes from God. So we praise God. We thank God. They do everything to please God. With a smile to God in their hearts, they forgive everyone. They have compassion for everyone. Speak well of everyone. Otherwise, don't say anything. Don't say anything. Speak well of everyone. Even if, in your opinion, somebody else is being misbehaving, or be careful. Be very careful. We can't judge. We can't judge. I judge only, not I judge. If God enlightens me, enlightens me about the state of the soul of a person and tells me that that person is in the state of sin and on the path of hell. In that case, all right, okay, I tell him prudently, lovingly, not publicly. But otherwise, I speak well of everyone. I have to give account to God for every word I say. I speak well of everyone. I pray for everyone, that's why, right. pray for everyone and help those who have a perfect love of God and help wherever possible everyone. So again, those who have a perfect love of God rejoice, this is something important as well, eh? because the devil can tempt us to fall in this sin. It is a sin against the Holy Spirit. Those who have a perfect love of God rejoice in seeing someone better than themselves and thank God for that better person or for those better persons. In all human being, what I said is a sin against the Holy Spirit is that say you are envious because you are seeing somebody better than you. No, if there is something better than you, God has given him or her what is better. So thank God. Thank God for that. This is what our behavior should be. In all human beings, they, they always, those who have a perfect love of God, or those who are trying by God's help, to arrive at the state of having a perfect love of God. In all human beings, they see their brothers and sisters. So they do not look down upon them or nurture envy, cultivate, in other words, envy or hatred of others in their hearts and minds. They are patient with everyone. Patience is, every, is something that we need to practice, so to say, every single second of our lives. If we are alone, we need to be patient with ourselves. If we are in a family, we need to be patient with the behavior of each and every member of the family. In church, we have to be patient with different, with priests, we have to be patient, we have to be patient with friars, we have to be patient with uh, the congregation, everywhere, wherever we are, wherever we are, at work, on the streets, whatever. We have to be patient all the time for the love of God, and God will look down upon us and say, this is one of my sons, this is one of my daughters in whom I am well pleased. Do you want God to say that about you? 
So, those who have a perfect love of God, they keep calm always when they hear someone speak ill of them. Of course, if someone speaks well of you, <laughs> you are not going to be impatient. Eh? But if you hear somebody saying something against you, perhaps even a lie, you keep calm. Of course, if prudence requires that you speak up, do speak up, do speak up, but calmly and lovingly and for God's love and glory. But don't be offended if someone speaks ill of you or you determine not to greet that person anymore. Well, if you usually greet him, continue to greet him or her. Of course, we can't greet every person we meet in the, on the street. <laughs> so, remember always that not what we feel matters to God, but what we want. This is important because sometimes people tell me, ask me, somebody might tell me, but, you know, I feel this, I feel that. It doesn't matter. Feel whatever you want. What do you want? God, that, looks at that, at your sincere intention. And of course, at your sincere means to, to, to realize that intention, to actuate that intention. It's important. Not just the purpose, the aim has to be good, but also the means to achieve, to attain that aim has to be morally good. Both, both. I can't do something evil to obtain something good. I, I can't. God does not want that. No, does not, doesn't want that. So, it, that is very, very important. Our nature always wants to answer back. But our perfect love for God tells us to keep silent. And of course, as you know, I was speaking about our nature. And what is important is what we want and not what we feel. I can feel envy or hatred or for any person and so on. Keep calm. Let nature feel whatever it wants. But I love that person, God, I love. Give him perfect love. Fill him with many graces. Our nature, of course, is alive. We are not dead, we are alive. And sensitive, and sensitive. But our smile to God is stronger than our feelings. Do you smile to God? Do you often smile to God? God likes our smile. He wants us to smile to Him. It's part of our perfect love to smile to God happily, gladly. Now, so this is what I am pointing out here. Our nature wants to answer back, say. Our nature feels but before God matters what we want, not what we feel. Now, these situations, so to say bad situations, if you want, can arise also in church societies, and movements, convents, even in convents, even among priests themselves, and church associations, where you can be ignored, and rejected. In such cases, always remain calm, patient, and smilingly tell Jesus, Jesus, I'm not ignored and rejected by you, but loved and esteemed. So always take these sad occasions as an efficacious means 
efficacious means. These said occasions are efficacious means for God to increase your perfect love for him and consequently to draw you closer to himself, something that you desire greatly. Now I shall pass on to St. John Bosco. I have called today, today's video St. John Bosco and a corrupted young man. Now, this young man, because he was still 16 years old, he was corrupted by somebody else. Not he corrupted others, but he was corrupted by. He is the victim. And now I shall speak about what St. John Bosco and this young man did throughout the uh, talk that I am going to uh, continue now on this case. And now, 16-year-old boy, or youth if you want, 16, 16-year-old youth, he used to attend the oratory on Sunday. Uh, when Don Bosco started the oratory, he got her children and young people on Sunday only. Then when he got a premise, a building, a place, he had also boarders, of course, who remained there with him day and night. But still, on Sunday, there were others who used to come on Sunday. And this one, we are I am narrating now, was one of these uh, children, because now he is 16 year old, children, who came on Sunday to the oratory to stay with St. John, John Bosco and listen to him and pray with him and play with him and with the other children as well and young people. <clears throat> now, this youth too was coming to the end of his life. He sent for Don Bosco because he wanted to confess. He was dying of tuberculosis. He lived in a house near San Rocco. Now San Rocco as well is a village in the province of Turin, like Lanzo Torinese. And Don Bosco went to assist him. That young man was thrilled when he saw St. John Bosco in his room. He asked Don Bosco to hear his confession. So his father and mother, who were with him, their son, on the deathbed, eh, they were with him. But so now he needed to confess, so his mother and, and father left the room. and. Uh, St. John Bosco, of course, could hear his confession. After the confession, his father and mother came back. His father stood on one side of the bed and his mother stood on the other side. Don Bosco, near the headrest, near uh, this boy, near his head, practically. Eh? Yes, and uh, suddenly they saw the face of the dying youth turning sad. Of course, at first, everyone thought he was sad because he was dying. But suddenly the youth told his mother, I would like you to ask the youth that once was my friend of mine, and he lives in the floor below us, to come and see me now, while I am dying. And uh, his mother told him, why do you want him to come now? And the youth, the dying youth told him, told her, well, I know why. I would like to say a word to him. Don Bosco, seeing that his parents were unwilling to call his friend, said to the dying youth, now don't worry about anyone or anything. Why do you want to call him? But when they saw that their son absolutely wanted to see his friend, they went to call him. His friend came, his friend came, entered the bedroom, moved towards the bed, but he had his eyes terrifying eyes 
fixing his eyes on his dying friend. The dying youth struggled to sit up on the bed. His parents helped him up by putting some pillows under his armpits. When he was seated, the dying young man fixed his eyes on, his, on the eyes of his friend, raised his right arm towards him and pointed his index, the second finger, pointed his index towards his friend and in a low and almost dying voice told him, you, and here he stopped and began to take a few breaths, then started coughing a little and rested. And when he rested, he continued, you were the one who corrupted me. I curse the moment when I met you the first time. I blame you for my miserable health. You are to blame for my dying so young. You taught me many wicked things which I hadn't known before. You betrayed me. You made me lose God's grace. Your words and bad example have driven me to do what is wrong. And now the evil you have done to me is filling my heart with great bitterness. Oh, if I had followed the advice given to me by those who told me to leave you. And here a tear flowed down from the eyes of both parents and of Don Bosco himself. His friend, his friend was shocked, fell sick and was about to fall to the ground but, but managed to hold on to the bedroom, bedboard. Don Bosco here told the dying youth, enough, that's enough, calm down and rest. Why are you troubling yourself so much for nothing? Let bygones be bygones now. Don't think about it anymore. You have made a good confession, and so you have nothing to fear. God has forgiven you, and you have has forgiven you everything. God is so good. And that you said, yes, God is very good, true. But if it weren't for him, I would still be innocent and happy, and I wouldn't be as I am now. And Don Bosco told him, there he is in front of you. Forgive him, as the Lord has forgiven you. Your forgiveness has come from God's mercy. The dying one said, yes, I forgive him. I forgive him heartily. And as he said this, he covered his face with his hands, burst into tears, and laid his head in the pillow. Then Don Bosco told the dying youth's parents to take his friend out of the room. His friend then had tears in his eyes and was so helpless that those parents helped him go down the stairs and enter his house. Meanwhile, Saint John Bosco, with his beautiful and sweet words, filled the heart of the dying youth with great peace and remained with him until he drew his last breath. You who are listening and me, one day in heaven together shall be, always by the power of God's grace.